Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. One of the things that my radio station wants me to do more often is uh, express my own points of view. I have the a real pleasure of meeting a lot of really interesting people and interviewing them. And Carla, who we just uh, chatted with, is one of those interesting people. Uh, but uh, they want me to uh, express my own points of view. And so I really want to talk uh, tonight uh, for the next couple of minutes about housing. I think it is probably the issue for... Um, for now, if climate change is the sort of the big issue for our generation, I think housing is the big issue for, you know, the next couple of years. Uh, CMHC says we need uh, 1.8 million extra homes in Southern Ontario in the next eight years, just to keep current levels of affordability. Um, uh, you know, Premier Ford has been talking about 1.5 million homes. That's not even a big enough target. And we've got no way in heck of meeting either one of those targets right now. So I think that we need and all hands on deck, attention to this strategy. And there's been a lot of lip service paid, um, a lot of proposals made, but not a lot has got done. And uh, and and if anything, what's been going on of late is um, developments have been put on hold and the problem's getting worse. So I've got about a 10 point plan for what needs to be happening. First and most imp importantly, approval times need to be shortened dramatically by municipal governments, municipal planning departments. CMHC said that uh, Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal were some of the, the, the worst places in Canada and worst in the world uh, for the time to get approval to build a development. It takes two times as long to get an approval to develop or build something as it does to actually build it. It makes no logical sense. And it's caused by excessive red tape, government interference, nimbyism, uh, et cetera. I'm not saying that communities shouldn't have an impact, but you can do that efficiently and quickly. I'm not saying that planning departments shouldn't review and that safety is paramount, but the not touch it for several months, uh, um, hand it around to 12 different departments, um, you know, have, uh, you know, NIMBYs uh, from excessive community consultation over and over and over again, reviewing things and saying no to almost anything that is proposed makes no sense. And so I think that uh, we need to get approval times down to like a year, not three to five years, or some people actually say seven. Um, and uh, and I don't think there's any reason why you can't approve a development in that kind of time frame. Uh, and I think that uh, cities should be compensated by provincial and federal governments if they get approval times down to a year and disincentivized where they don't get some funding for infrastructure monies or other things if they have excessively long uh, approval times. Number two, the regulatory burden. I think I've been involved in numerous different businesses. I've been in the amusement business, the restaurant business, the hotel business, the pharmaceutical business. I am shocked at the regulatory burden in the real estate business. And people think the real estate business is this you know, pure form of free enterprise and capitalism. And yet governments seem to think that they can tell you how many parking spots what type of windows, whether the, the balcony has got to be attached by, by a certain thing or not. Um, there is more regulatory burden um, and uh, red tape and, and, and government knows best in the real estate industry than in almost any industry I know of other than the pharmaceutical business. And in the pharmaceutical business, they don't actually have the, the impact on it other than to study it and say yes or no if the pharmaceutical product works. I don't think we'd accept this kind of government um, burden on uh, on on designing a new cracker or a new Coca Cola or a new whatever. Um, but for some reason, because zoning regulations were put in place, you know, two generations ago, uh, and planning departments have grown and grown and grown, um, we accept this kind of regulatory burden where they where, where 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 city planning departments and city councilors and city councils have an incredible amount of input on and decision-making power over almost everything a real estate developer wants to do. And I say, let the market decide. If, if, if one condo wants to have twice as many parking spots as the condo next door, or twice as many bike racks, or balconies or no balconies, or great amenity space or less amenity space, but it's cheaper with less amenity space, let the market decide what they want to have. But for some reason, in real estate, we don't think the market knows best. We think government planning departments and city councils know best. It's wrong. It's a mistake. Let people decide. And number three, development fees. Development fees are outrageously expensive, and they are a tax on the least advantaged in our society. They're a tax on newcomers, on young people that want to get into the 
to the the home ownership market and on uh, on on renters that want to go from renting to uh, to buying. And these development fees were put in place originally probably for good smart reasons because they were to to pay for development. But now they just go into general tax revenue. And even for something that's not going to some development that's not even going to demand uh, increases in infrastructure or dramatic increases in infrastructure, there's outrageous development fees. Um, uh, put on it. And and development fees differ dramatically in different municipalities, which again, doesn't make logical sense. It, it proves that they're not actually for the cost of development. It's just what the, you know, what the community thinks they can charge. If we want to build more housing, if we think housing is critical, which it is, why have a tax on every new, new, new unit of like $140,000? It's dumb, just plain dumb. But if development fees are reduced Municipal governments will have less money, and the provincial government is going to have to either give them more taxing power or give them uh, transfers uh, to compensate them for it. But it shouldn't be newcomers, renters, and my kids and your kids that want to get into the home ownership market that are paying this tax that is of benefit to all of society. So those are three big impacts that to city governments can do. Approval times reduced, regulatory burdens dramatically reduced, and development fees reduced uh, or frankly, get close to eliminated. What should the provincial government do? I think a couple of things. Number one, major transit zones. There's been a lot of talk about this, that around major transit zones, that they should increase the density. I think that that should be almost unlimited density and, and almost unlimited height. And maybe not unlimited, but a lot. Because I think, again, the market should decide. I don't think the market is going to say there's an 80-story tower at 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 Young and Lawrence, or but there might be a market for an 80-story tower at Young and Eglinton. And I think the market will tell the developers and other developers in competition will tell uh, each other in, in competition like they do in any other segment of society what you should be building. And I think the fact that we've got a couple of developers at Blur and Young competing to have the highest building, I think it's fantastic. And I think that's what should happen. And I think if you think about Young Street and the density that's along Young Street at those major transit zones, but doesn't exist half a block or a block away, doing so is not going to change Toronto dramatically everywhere, but it will change Toronto dramatically from an affordability standpoint and along Young Street, along Blur Street. And I think this should be applied to GO trains, GO train stations, and major bus routes. Maybe not every bus route, but major bus routes, because buses are, are moving just as many people as go trains and uh, and, uh, and 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 subways. And so I think that we should around major transit zones, say a kilometer, people are talking about 800 meters, I think it should be a kilometer, um, that you can have, if not unlimited density and, and no height limits, almost that. And I use the example of Mayor Hazel McCallion, former mayor of Mississauga. She put a no height limit in downtown uh, Mississauga around square one. And what it did is it got a whole bunch of developers hiring star architects to really build beautiful, interesting buildings because they had to compete. If there was someone else that could build just a big building next door, they wanted beautiful buildings. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I think around these major transit zones, you also need to have affordable housing. And that should be the, the quid pro quo. If we're going to give you dramatic increased density and increased height, we should have inclusionary zoning. We should have... Uh, 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 affordable housing. And 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 whether that's 5% or 10% or 20%, I'm not sure. Um, in every city around North America, other than Portland and Toronto, when they put in place affordable zoning, uh, affordable inclusionary zoning uh, for affordable housing, they compensated with increased density. Toronto a year ago when they, when they put in inclusionary zoning did not. I think that it should be a quid pro quo. We're going to give you the increased density, but you want to give us 10% uh, inclusionary zoning of affordable housing. I think that's got to be the quid pro quo. And finally, I think it should be connected to transit. We should we should try to make the connection as as close as possible. I think in addition, uh, the province should get involved in approving as of right zoning for things like granny flats, laneway housing, um, uh, duplexes, et cetera, so that you don't have to go through a massive uh, approval process. If, if someone wants to build a, a home in their backyard for a mother-in-law, uh, or a father-in-law, uh, or a basement apartment, a legal basement apartment for, for students or for immigrants or refugees or whatever it is. I think that it should be really easy to do that as long as you abide by health, safety, fire, et cetera. I think we need more transit. There's just no question about it. We are building the Ontario line today. We're building the Eglinton Crosstown. That's not enough. When you take a look at London, you take a look at Paris, you take a look at Chicago, you take a look at New York, even Los Angeles, frankly, with their new LRTs, the transit 
routes are all over the city and they're not in uh, Toronto. And I think on some of these transit routes, we can have some more stations. Uh, I took a look at the big move uh, economics at one point in time. The Milton Mississauga line has an eight to one benefit to cost ratio. I was told by a transit consultant uh, that worked on that, that it's the highest benefit to cost ratio of any transit uh, uh, route that he's seen in, in his uh, 50 years of experience in the transit uh, rail business. Why? Because it goes uh, you know, diagonally right through Mississauga, uh, through Etobicoke, through Milton, um, and it gets people from a very wide swath of land that would otherwise be taking the 427, the QEW, and the Gardner Expressway to their jobs. Um, that should be all-day two-way service, and I think we frankly should have a, additional stations, and I've been recommending for a long time that a station at Sherway, a station at Cothra, uh, a station at uh, Eglinton uh, may make a lot of sense and should be looked at because I think then it becomes a surface subway rather than just a uh, a freight train taking people down uh, in the morning to Union Station and uh, and back out. Um, Yorkdale gets something like 25% of its uh, demand from the Yorkdale subway station. Why shouldn't Sherway get that benefit? And it gives people traffic going both ways um, uh, during the day rather than just downtown in the morning and, and out of town uh, in the evening. Uh, there's talk about uh, on the Lakeshore line having another station somewhere close to this big Lakeview um, development uh, uh, between Cothra and Dixie. I think that makes sense. So more transit, we need to be done. Um, the Bolton line should also, uh, I think, be built, uh, et cetera. And then the federal government should get involved. And what the, should the federal government be doing? I think, number one, it should eliminate the GST on all new housing. If we want to have a major acceleration of development, scrapping the GST on new housing development would incentivize a whole bunch of developers to get building right away. Land for development. The federal government, the provincial government, but particularly the federal government has a ton of land, um, surplus land across the country, candle lands. Uh, is an organization that is uh, slated to uh, to sell off that land uh, in Port Credit. There's a beautiful development uh, that uh, Candle Lands own that uh, could be developed into housing and or, I, I've argued for a long time, a retail entertainment complex, um, the old big wharf that sits out on Port Street. Uh, and that kind of land exists across the country. I don't think that the, the government should do it themselves. I think they should do it in partnership with developers. They should be contributing the land. The developers should come in and, and develop and contribute the equity, uh, get the construction financing, away we go, and the, and the government gets the profit. And in that, the government should always be saying, we want some level of affordable housing. And that should be part of the, the government's um, desire to enter into these partnerships. Uh, and CMHC, CMHC, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, a federal government agency, takes way too long. Used to be two weeks, supposedly, before they looked at an application. Now they're saying it's two to four months. Um, and if that's the case, we need more people in CMHC, and we need to review them in far greater detail, um, far faster. Um, and they should be applied to not just rental, but to, to ownership, because ownership gives people a sense of pride. Uh, and a uh, and a and a and a real commitment to their to their house to their community etc. So three things that the municipality should do: approval times reduced, regulatory burden reduced, development fees reduced or eliminated. Uh, three things that the the province should do: uh, major transit zones, height density increases, affordable housing uh, demands for quid pro quo of those major transit zones. Um, as of right, uh, abilities for granny flats, laneway houses, et cetera, uh, and more transit. That was actually four things, I guess. Uh, dramatically increased transit investment. And then three things that the federal government should be do. Eliminate the GST on new housing, land for development, uh, joint venture with uh, local developers, and demand affordable housing, and uh, increase the commitment to the CMHC, uh, and uh, decrease dramatically the time for approval, of uh, applications to CMHC and make it available for both uh, rental housing as well as uh, as ownership, condos, et cetera. So that's my 10 point plan. And I got one more. The green belt should be sacrosanct, should not be in any way, shape or form, not one inch given over to private developers. It should be our heritage, our patrimony, our, our, our preservation for the, for the future. We don't need it. We've got more than enough land elsewhere. It may not be green. It's going to be yellow. It's going to be industrial. It's going to be shopping center parking lots. It's going to be up in the air above transit zones. But we've got the area to, to solve this problem without destroying our heritage. Anyway, that's my 11-point plan. Thanks for listening. Good night, everybody.